Scholars from across the world gathered on the grounds of Mu Yang Sa Temple in Palolo Valley, Oahu, to imagine a global, non-killing society. University of Hawaii political scientist Dr. Glenn D. Page, author of A Global Non-Killing Political Science, gathered guests from over 40 countries for consultation of this great idea. In our first program, we showcase thoughts of non-killing societies from a Hawaiian, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, humanist, and Islamic approach. In this program, we present Alice Tucker and her views of Judaism. Myree McGuire, Nobel Peace Laureate, speaking on non-killing leadership and a global condition. A.T. Adiyaratni, founder and president of the Sarbodia Shamadana movement on non-killing leadership for no poverty development and Dr. Glenn D. Page, author of Non-Killing Global Political Science on a Non-Killing World is Possible. You know, in terms of proportionality, in terms of the future, in terms of culture, in terms of utilitarian, utilitarian notion, what does it mean? It means that non-killing is not only possible, it is an imperative for the world God creates with mercy. Wabillahi taufiq wal bihidayah. Salamat. Thank you, Jared. That's a very uh, original contribution. I had not heard such an exposition on peace and Islam. I mean, from bringing the ants and birds and infants and saving human life together. Our next speaker is uh, Alice Tucker from Hawaii itself. Alice, and Thank you. Uh, Alice would be speaking on non-killing in Judaism. Uh, I am totally awed and overwhelmed by being on the panel with these esteemed people. Uh, the only other member who doesn't have a doctor before her name is a, a, a Nobel Peace Laureate. <laughs> <laughs> if my friends could see me now. Um, I confess, and confession is not a part of Judaism because we are expected to act correctly and not need to confess. Uh, that I did consult with my spiritual leader who is Rabbi Peter Shackman of Temple Emmanuel here in Honolulu for guidance. I also prayed a lot. Uh, to say that we are, or at least should strive to be, a non-killing global society is a glorious goal. Unfortunately, throughout the world, there are entire populations whose value systems don't place the same standards on a living being and preservation thereof as do we. We should not, however, lower our standards or moral code and must use gatherings such as this to make non-killing the right thing. I liken this cause to the once not very fashionable environmentalists who seem to be lone voices in the wilderness. Would that non-killing might become as universally accepted. One of the oldest references to non-killing was brought down by one of our boys, a gentleman named Moses, from Mount Sinai. These tenets to live by, given by the Almighty, were in the form of stone tablets now called the Ten Commandments. The sixth of these commandments has been interpreted in more than one way. The translation from Hebrew is, thou shalt not murder. A distinction is made between murder and kill. It's important to stress that in the Torah, the most important document in and cornerstone of Judaism, there are some circumstances where killing is countenanced. These include self-defense and surprisingly capital punishment. Whoa, I'm popping, I'm trying to get away from that, but I'm popping. Um, the Torah, which is what the Christians refer to as the Old Testament, is not universally pacifist. However, one of Judaism's highest values is 
pikuach nefesh, which is the saving of life or preserving life. A basic tenet in Jewish theology is that humans are created in God's image, so destruction of a human implies the destruction of God's image in the world. Killing is considered a deep failure since destroying God's image is a tragedy. Talmudic writing states that killing one innocent person is like killing humanity, and has been stated earlier this morning, saving one innocent person is like saving humanity. Historically, Jews have been nonviolent throughout most of history, mainly because they did not have power. An old joke tells of a Jewish man in Russia who said to some Russian soldiers, we're better than you because we don't hunt. The soldiers replied, of course you don't hunt. We don't allow you to have guns. In ancient times, wars of Israel were a matter more for theology than for politics. They took place in scripture against the evil inclination more than against any historical foe. The sword and bow mentioned in Genesis 48:22, are in fact prayer and beseeching. The soldier and warrior and those who repel attacks at the gate in the book of Isaiah 3:2 and 28:6 are not warriors in the literal sense, but those who know how to dispute in the battle of the Torah. The sword of the mighty is the Torah. David's warriors were none other than manifestations of the might of his spirit as he took part in the session of scholars. Judaism has always been involved in seeking and pursuing peace. Jews have been commanded to go door to door with the message of peace. Throughout the Torah, there are many passages, seek peace and pursue it. In biblical times, Many options were given to avoid conflict. For instance, if an army wanted to overtake a city, the leader was required to first offer peace terms, make sure that the army didn't destroy crops of the city, didn't destroy the water supply, and must allow all those who wished the chance to leave. We all know the old expression, an eye for an eye, etc. Jewish tradition never took it literally. Throughout the ages, Jews have been known for their, have not been known for their fight, but for their flight, usually through persecution. Between 20 AD and the early 20th century, the issue of Jewish fighting or wars was a non-issue. Then the political world intervened. That being said, self-defense is not only permitted, but encouraged and traditional and non-traditional weapons have been used with ingenuity and success. Well-known examples of Jews defending their religion and their very being include David's defense against Goliath, the Maccabees' national liberation movement against Antiochus IV of the Hellenistic Seleucid dynasty in 167 BCE, and the uprising in the Jewish ghetto of Warsaw during World War II. Clearly, Jews participated in killing, but also clearly, these were instances of righteous self-defense. The Talmud, a record of rabbinic discussions pertaining to Jewish law, ethics, customs, and history, consists of the first written compendium of Judaism's oral law discussion thereof and is the basis for all codes of rabbinic law. It specifically refers to execution or capital punishment as the proper punishment for so-called capital crimes such as a Jew killing another Jew. Furthermore, it refers to the fact that if a non-Jew kills another non-Jew, he should not be judged by Jews but by divine providence. The Nobel Peace Prize is the highest honor a person can receive, as my esteemed co-panelist knows. Ninety-five individuals, not including organizations, have been awarded this great honor. Of the recipients, nine have been Jewish. 
In conclusion, non-killing and the absence of strife is such an integral part of Judaism that the person-to-person -person greeting and farewell in the Jewish state of Israel is, of course, the word shalom. We've all assumed that the proper translation of the word is peace. However, the literal translation is, as a quality of peace, wholeness, blessed harmony, and by extension, inner balance. Here in Hawaii, we have a similar word, unfortunately made almost trite by overuse, but nonetheless a beautiful, meaningful word, and it is, of course, aloha. We must continue to strive for a world of shalom and aloha. In Hawaii, we Jews have the best of circumstances as we strive to live a life of shalom and aloha, and to that end, we have adapted this feeling of wholeness, inner balance, and yes, peace, and have coined an appropriate word, shaloha. My most sincere wish for us all today and in all our world is a life of shaloha. Thank you very much, Alice. And we will say shaloha to you also. For the, this next section, we have uh, three keynote speakers, uh, Murray McGuire, uh, Dr. Ari Ratne, and Professor Page. Uh, so let me just start with, first of all, uh, with Murray. Murray is going to be speaking on non-killing leadership and the global condition. Uh, Murray, uh, as you guys know, we have already mentioned that, you know, she's the Nobel Peace Laureate. She won her Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize in 1976 for her work which she did in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And I'm sure all of you know about the Irish situation which went on and on for ages. And it was her group at the grassroots level which was able to bring this, a sense of empowerment among people that things could be changed, things could be done. And the transformation which was brought by her and her uh, co-peace uh, activist Betty Williams uh, and that, that showed that what ordinary people can do, what ordinary, you know, they didn't, as Gandhi said, you don't have to be extraordinary for doing these things. And, uh, and since then, she has been involved in various causes, including ours, Non-Killing Global Society. Uh, she was uh, part of the Nobel uh, Peace Laureate's, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, proposal to the United Nations and UNESCO for declare, declaring 2001 to 2010 as the decade of the culture of peace and nonviolence of children. And currently she has been also meeting every year. She meets the Nobel Peace Laureates Club in Rome, and they are working very hard on developing this charter for world without no, nonviolence, uh, with a charter for world without violence. Uh, so the, uh, over to you, Mairead. I'm sure you're going to talk to some of these things. Thank you very much, Phil. Well, good morning again, my dear friends. And uh, we come here to spend a few days together, uh, building friendships and solidarity with each other in our great task of helping to build a world of nonviolence, justice, and love. This is rather a large task, but we're not alone in this work. A world of love and compassion, forgiveness, and non killing is also, I believe, the Creator's vision for all of humanity. It is also the dream deep in the hearts of every human being to be happy, to love and to be loved and to be part of what Martin Luther King called the beloved community. But how to build such a world, that is the question. When our dear friend and brother Glenn Page asks the question, is a non-killing world possible in his wonderful book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, we answer yes, and we add our own question, but how do we build a non-killing world? Indeed, how do we build a world without violence? Changing from a world situation where there is a great deal of violence to one of non-killing will take time. We must be patient and admit our shared vision of a non-killing world may not be fulfilled in our own lifetime. Like Martin Luther King, we have seen the mountain and we may not get there. But if we join together and work hard enough, 
our children and our children's children will get there. With that thought, we dedicate our lives to the joyful purpose of rebuilding our world in the image and likeness of the creators, one of beauty and celebration of life of all, and of all creation. To create a non-violent culture, we start from our own inner conviction that every human life is sacred, and we daily cultivate within ourselves a deep reverence for all life and creation. The more deeply conscious we become of our own gift of life and the presence of this mysterious love, the deeper our love, compassion and respect for others, including our enemies, become. Indeed, we lose the whole concept of enemy. This practice of the reflection of the gift of life and consciousness also awakens our inherited sense of justice and we become more aware of injustices against others of our own part willingly or unwillingly in such injustice and our responsibility to act justly and choose wisely as we know every act has its consequence. When we think deeply about the mystery and magnificence of our own gift of existence, we become more aware of the gift of choice. Millions of choices, some small, some not so small. But the most profound choice for each of us to make is to choose to live or to die, to kill or not to kill. That is the real question. So a non-killing world starts in our own minds when we choose to disarm our mindsets of violence, militaries and war and use the alternatives of non-violence open to us. We can choose also to live alive and be happy in the present moment gifted to us. This is both a spiritual and a political choice and it is a personal and a community one as we commit ourselves to the non-violent service of others. I believe though in our passion for non-violence, we must have the most profound humility and respect for others' right to choose their own paths, remembering that the spark of divinity lives in every heart and none of us have a monopoly on truth. We not, must not make false divisions between non-violent believers and unbelievers. We are the human family, interconnected, interdependent, and we need to work together, no matter what our differences, to the common goal of building a more just and humane world for all. We are faced with many threats to our very survival both the animal and human world. And these can be overcome by building strong bonds of friendship and cooperation at all levels of society and across our world. We are challenged to build vibrant, active, non-killing democracies from the local community upwards and at the same time across the cosmos. New organizations, new institutions, new ways of identifying and solving problems and sharing resources must be sought and shared as this new consciousness of humanity and our Mother Earth evolves. An ethical value-based code of conduct which we can all share is needed and the principle of love one another and do not kill I believe is one that can touch all our hearts. We can take encouragement too from the spiritual commitment of the world's great faiths to uphold the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. With great responsibility, the world's many faith traditions carry in today's in helping change things and to building a non-killing, non-violent world. The change can come about if we speak and act at a heart level. In today's world, climate, 
of feeding of people's fears by some political letters, leaders and some corporate media, many people feel isolated, vulnerable, afraid, and powerless. That is why we need, as a human family, to reach out to each other in friendship and in love. We must also challenge those in political, spiritual, educational, media leadership who seek to divide and segregate us. Terms like clash of civilization, for or against us, evil empires, rogue states, have no truth or find foundation and are feeding fear and insecurity everywhere. The culture of demonization of certain countries and leaders and their spiritual political traditions must be challenged by those of us who are committed to truth telling. We must have the courage to speak truth to power when that power becomes murderous, as we have seen with the USA, the UK invasion and occupation of Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Soviet Union's military abuse of power in Chechnya, and Israel's continued occupation of Palestine, to mention but a few of the gross abuses of human rights, including torture carried out by some of the world governments. We must insist on our governments speaking to representatives of armed groups in order to deal with their grievance as the British government spoke to the Irish Republican Army to solve the problem of Northern Ireland conflict. There are always alternatives to violence, militaris militarism and war, and we must insist our governments and leaders use these alternative methods open to them. So too with those who take up armed struggles, revolution, insurgency groups, suicide bombings, whilst we uphold their right to non-violent civil disobedience and non-violent resistance to injustice, we must insist they have no right to kill or harm people and they too must enter into dialogue to solve their grievances. No injustice or grievance is worth the taking of people's lives by either governments, insurgency, armed groups, or anyone else. Dialogue and conflict resolution does work. Indeed, this has been proven in Northern Ireland when militarism and paramilitarism fed a deadly cycle and only dialogue could break through this. In building a non-killing, non-violent society, our language and communication skills are very important. As when we refuse to allow, allow weapons and armies to be described as instruments of peacemaking, our alternative tools are listening and unconditional dialogue. And we must develop our skills and alternatives to violence so they are effective and life changing. Alternatives such as the very excellent movement, Nonviolent Peace Force, need our support and encouragement as they prepare unarmed peace workers for conflict zones as alternative to armed intervention. Education will be an important vehicle for creating a new culture of non killing, non violence. And the Nobel Peace Laureates and the UN Decade for a Culture on Peace and Nonviolence for the Children of the World continues to bear fruits in many innovative peace education programs. I was so excited to see recently on television a program showing teachers in primary school teaching young children how to understand and deal with their emotions of anger, fear, and pain, overcoming our fear of ethnic annihilation embarrassment, death, will be our greatest challenge as we develop a non-killing culture. Another hopeful development took place in Rome last year at the Gorbachev Conference when the Charter for a World Without Violence was adopted by 20 Nobel Peace Laureates and organisations and supported by many more. 
This charter will be formally launched in December in Rome. It sets out principles which I believe we as the human family will find speaks to many of our hearts and minds as values we can identify with and own. It gives voice to the need to respect every human being and the environment, uphold human rights and international law, and sets out a vision of a world without violence. It is hoped this charter will be supported by youth, civil uh, society, NGOs, faith traditions, and will add to the many charters, treaties, and international legal agreements, which help us as a human family to build a foundation of justice and peace for all. The first parliament in the world to adopt this charter, together with the proposal for a government ministry of peace, was Calabria in, in Italy. I'd like to propose that this forum also support the charter, as I believe it will prove valuable in encouraging our governments and others to seek alternatives to violence in their policies and programs. I believe too that the growing movement to encourage governments to set up ministries, which others here will be speaking about, will give great encouragement to us all. Another hopeful sign is the recognition by many world bodies that violence is a health issue. The World Health Organization has said, violence is a preventable disease. And these words give us hope that violence is not inevitable. We can each do something to prevent it. Governments are elected to provide peace and security for their people. Can they say they are exceeding when the incidence of mental health in every country in the world is increasing? Depression amongst children as young as seven? Suicide, one a day in my own country? What policies and funding are in place with such sad and tragic signs of hopelessness and despair? What policies are addressing these issues? Do our government's policies of war nuclear weapons, arms deals, invasions, occupations, and the violence of insurgency groups shown every day on our television screens and beamed into every home around the world, not create climates of fear, powerlessness, depression, and desensitization, desensitization of our children to cruelty and violence, all methods that are unconsciously picking up as allegedly normal ways of behavior, how much we need those important pillars of society, the faith traditions, governments, media, education, the arts, to help articulate and give hope to alternatives, which give confidence and empower people to believe in themselves, to build strong communities of support, and to have hope for the future. I applaud and congratulate the many bodies who are already doing a great deal to bring about political and social change. In my travels, I've been inspired by the massive people's grassroots movements around the world. This movement includes millions of people and is indeed the real superpower, which says no to war and yes to justice and peace. Their agenda and policies have identified the real and most and more immediate threats to humanity, such as climate change, increasing violence and ethnic political conflict, poverty and marginalization of the majority of the people of the world, competition over resources, global militarization. <coughs> the people's movement are asking their political leaders, what are your policies on these real threats to our survival. The People's Movement have a vision and agenda for a world of peace and justice, equality and non-killing. In this work we are united and it is only a matter of time that our political leaders are forced to change their policies and begin playing an important role in the building of a culture of world equality and justice. We all work for that day to come soon. But in the meantime, we as individuals are called to be true to our own conscience and live out of our own lives non-violently and with as much joy, with as much truth, with as much celebration and with as much integrity as possible. 
God bless you all in your visionary work for non-killing world and a world without violence. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you for your inspiration, your wonderful leadership. We are proud to stand alongside you in our belief that when you dream the impossible, the impossible becomes real. Aloha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ray, for such a inspirational and challenging remarks. You know, that's what we needed this morning, and I'm sure our other speakers are going to be doing the same. Uh, the message uh, in your remarks, which I got, was the the dialogue and uh, conflict resolution does work. Uh, there are always alternatives to violence, militarism, and war, and we must insist our world governments and leaders to use these alternative methods to, uh, to, to, res to respond, to be responsive. And, uh, you know, as you say, we must have the courage to speak truth to power. And you have shown through your various actions over the time, you have that courage to stand up uh, and speak the truth. Thank you very much. Well, our next esteemed speaker is Dr. Ari Ratne. Uh, Dr. Ari Ratne, as I earlier said, is a president of Sri Lanka's Saravodhya Sharamandana movement, which is a non-profit organization that involves millions of people in 15,000 villages in development projects. It is a, Sri Lanka's largest non-governmental organization. Uh, as I said earlier, to me, Dr. Ariratne embodies Gandhi because the, his program reminds me of Gandhi's construction program, which Gandhi spoke about. So he and his workers on ground are delivering that for 50 years, over 50 years, that Gandhian dream of what a village development at village level could achieve. Dr. Ariratne has received many international awards uh, and two or few of these which he re recently received include Mahatma Gandhi Service Award in South Africa, Sushil Kumar International Peace Award uh, in Canada, and then Mahatma Gandhi Peace Award in India in 1996, Hubert Humphrey Award 1996, and the list goes on. Thank you very much, Dr. Ari Ratna, for coming over here, and we look forward to listening to you. Dear respected elders, dear sisters and brothers, I consider this to be a very unique gathering because we have a definite objective in view that is a non-killing society. I'm a strong believer that such a society is possible within our lifetime, not in the distant future. I started what I am doing today 50 years ago. From one village, it went to a second, third, fourth, like that, in arithmetical progression, to about 200 villages, in about three, four years. Then it started expanding geometrically every year till it came to about 15,000 villages. And then I said, let us stop counting because the next will be a quantum jump. In other words, we should be able to bring these processes we are releasing step by step, very patiently, or a long period of time, will straight away embrace the entire country of 20 million people. I said that because of number of reasons. Inherently, we are nonviolent. So a lot of people, a lot of so-called scholars, have been telling us instinctively we are violent. I don't believe in that. I think by nature we are nonviolent. In the Buddhist culture I was born, 
one of the most important teachings of the Buddha was interdependence, paticca samuppada dharma. That is, twelve causes of interdependence. So we are all interdependent. Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh call it interbeing. I live in you, you live in me. We all live in all the other living beings in the world. With the advancement of science, and especially communication technology, I don't think there is any reason to believe that organized killing that is going on will continue. The organized greed that is going on in the name of economic development can continue like that. I don't believe that world can be any longer kept ignorant. People will not be ready to be ignorant, to be fooled to say that there are just wars. Violence can do it. In my own country, there is violence being used both by the government as well as by those who oppose the government who have taken up guns against the government. In a in a in an environment like that, we are able to survive and work and contribute to building peace as well as some kind of development, because we looked at this whole thing as a whole, a totality of the situation. We believe that in the concept of the Buddha that the entire living world is one. We should work towards the awakening, the well-being of all, Gandhiji's principle of Sarvodaya. So when we accept the awakening or the welfare of all, we have to accept truth, non-violence, as well as destroying selfishness, self-denial. So in rural communities, we start our non-violent process with pregnant women. We call the expectant mothers with their husbands to come on the weekend to our centers. And they are learn both the science of child development as well as the spirituality, the spiritual science of meditation, how to link up with the child while the child is in the mother's womb. Now this is very important because a lot of human beings grow up in a mother's womb in a very unsettled, very violent, conflicting environment. So if we can make the parents understand that child should grow up in a mother's womb in a normal manner, there we begin non-violence. Then we established a chain of preschools all over the country for children below five years of age. And there you lay a foundation in non-violence, mutuality, cooperation, forgiveness with children. Then of course, compulsory education we have in our country where the government holds the monopoly, but there again, we do everything possible to influence them. Then we get the children between 15 and after school children also, up to 25, so that they form into peace brigades, Shanti Sena groups. Now these groups of 11, one leader and 10 others, they are trained over a period of time to deal with different situations, both in times of peace, also at times of conflict. So these groups number over 103,000 today. And these groups play a very big role in transforming the consciousness of people. Because to bring about a nonviolent society, we have to bring about a transformation in the consciousness. We have to bring about a transformation in the economy of the people. We have to bring about a th transformation in the way power 
or in the way politics uh, goes on in our societies. So in three fields pertaining to the war, we are very active. In the first field, I mentioned about meditation programs or expectant mothers. Similarly, in jails, in schools, maybe for people in the police or the army even, sometimes they say, we want to undergo this. So anybody, it doesn't matter, we try to teach them the importance of nonviolence through meditational processes. In the central jail, about six weeks ago, we opened all the cells and brought over 5,000 prisoners out into the field to sit down in the compound and got them to meditate. There are regular meditation programs for them also. Similarly, from the conflict areas, we try to exchange families from the north or the east to the south and take families from the south to the north or east so that they could live together. Then they begin to see how their children were killed. One belonging to the military, the other belonging to the terrorists or insurgents or freedom fighters or whatever you call. The mothers meet and try to find out what happened to their children. Why? Why should they sacrifice their children for something which is not related to them? So this war mentality, mentality that military power or taking the gun is the solution to our problems, even this is tackled by the people who are affected. You will see a little movie, just three minutes, where 170, 370 Muslim families, where we have a Sarvodaya Shramadana society in that village, these Muslim uh, people said we have never had Singhala and Tamil youths coming and living in our homes. We come, they come, we associate with them, but we want them to be a part and parcel of our families. In other words, to live with their families for three, four days, five days. So we got children from Tamil as well as single areas to come to these Muslim families, live with these 370 Muslim families. While sharing their life, they did some constructive work where they were building a road, the playground and things like that with their labor. Now, that brings about a permanent transformation in the thinking of people. We are one humanity. We are one family. Nonviolence is not the way. Uh, violence is not the way. Nonviolence is the only way. In that manner, these people are transformed. Sometimes, when some of our people go to the uh, conflict areas and visit some families, we find that three youths at home belong into three different militant groups. One to the government, the other to the LTT, a third to a breakaway group of the LTT. When they were asked, how come you belong to three different groups and you fight one another? They say, well, we do this to bring money to our mother. So we belong to different sections. If there is an attack going on to the other party, we protect our brother. You see, this is something that has been inflicted on our society by forces that they have no control. What are these forces? Economic and political forces, and some irresponsible religious forces who also happen to believe in violence. Therefore, we have to attack on all fronts. So Sarvode is an integrated program where we try to bring day-to-day -day development activities to meet the the basic and secondary needs of people, and at the same time bring people together. Unfortunately, now say, we have regular peace meditation programs, maybe ranging from 5,000 on the 21st of September last month, 
month before last on the International Peace Day. In one of the conflict areas, I walked with 5,000 people, men, women, and children through the city of Trincomalee, came back in all 10 miles, then we meditated for one whole hour on peace. Here you could see Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, all together meditating for peace. We got as many, nearly a million, our target was a million year before last. But as one main road was closed, we couldn't get a million. It may have been anything between 900,000 and a million. Now, this was a very successful program where people tried to generate their nonviolent mental or emotional or spiritual energies and release it to what we call the psychosphere, so that everybody in the world can become peace conscious, spiritual. But newspapers did not have even two small lines on this. One newspaper said, Ari Ratna with a few people was praying for peace. If one man is killed, that is big headlines. So newspapers have not played their part, media have not played their part, that does not discourage us. Because we believe we have a, the mental power the power of the mind is supreme. If the mind could be silenced for a minute by a process of meditation where you concentrate on your breath or whatever, develop one-pointedness of mind and then develop loving-kindness towards all, human beings, animals, the entire nature, and then send it to wherever it goes and wish that people be well and happy, it's going to work. Sometimes immediately after the kind of meditation we did, we could see the results where even a temporary ceasefire, agreement is reached between conflicting parties. I'm not going to talk anything more on this. All I'm saying is, Professor Glenn Page, you have given the world the right topic, build a non-killing society at the right time, the time has come. And as uh, my previous uh, Nobel laureate said, in the grassroots, there are millions and millions of people who have rejected violence, who rejected war, who rejected economic exploitation in the world, any other forms of suppression. And these people are getting networked every day. So there will come a day very soon where we as a human society will make a quantum jump to peace. It will come just like that. Huh? Therefore, thank you very much for this opportunity. The rest of the four minutes I have, I will use to show you a movie. It's very short to show the spirit of what we are doing. Thank you very much. people 
non-killing society being feasible and possible. You have shown us through pra practical steps and practical program that, you know, from Dana that this could be done. And that was a very nice quote there, I noted down. We build the road and the road builds us. You know, that was very beautiful. And I see the filmmaker also on the other side sitting there. Thank you very much for the film also. <laughs> uh, our uh, next... Uh, Speaker is our friend Glenn, uh, Professor Glenn Page. I don't know what to say about him don't because we all know everything. You know, we we know so much about him, and all of us, our lives in, in many ways have been impacted by his uh, thoughts, words, and deeds. And um, uh, especially the book, I, I, call, I always call as the book, the book, because. <laughs> Every time we refer, I, whenever I talk to him, it was some sort of a chapter verse in there. And uh, that book, as all of us know, is being, uh, being translated in 25 languages. And you translators are around here, around the table. You have done your bit being his ambassador, because translators are the ambassadors of the writers. Of the writers. So that's what you have done. And you are carrying his message. And the message you know, we have all, already heard. So uh, 
Glenn, thank you very much. The word has spread around in five continents. Yesterday we were in his room there and we saw the whole, one by one, the 11 publications. 11? 13. 13? 13 published books already there. So you can imagine the word being there in the five continents. So those who are ready for the truth, the truth will get revealed to them, you know. And uh, so, sir, on to you. Non-killing world is possible. So, can you hear me? All right. Is that all right? Should I be closer to this mic? Yes. Yes. Like this. All right. Um, we have a Nobel Peace Laureate with us, as you know, but we also have uh, two nominees for Nobel Peace Laureate are also in this room because uh, Dr. Arya Ratna, our beloved Ari, is nominated many times. And it's just inevitable when they realize that. And uh, Senator Yolanda Pinto de Gaviria is right over there. And please be recognized with everyone. She has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. She is the widow of the murdered Governor Guillermo Gaviria of the Department of Antioquia in Colombia, who is completely dedicated to the nonviolence of Jesus, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King. And she marched uh, with him and 1,000 people. And Dr. Bernard Lafayette, uh, the close associate of doc Dr. Martin Luther King Jr and Captain Charles Elfin here, uh, the greatest uh, Kingian nonviolent trainers in the world, together on the march uh, to a, a coffee growing town on the top of a mountain, and the governor was killed. So uh, Yolanda, as we affectionately call her, is a Nobel Peace Laureate. So is Guillermo, but he was dead at the time, so they don't or, or, offer it posthumously. But anyway, and I, everyone else in here too. A lot of good things have been said about me, but I want to disclaim it <laughs> right away. The reason we are here is, is this reason.